The following broadcast may contain free thinking and open-minded discussion, ideas, skepticism, and adult subject matter. Topics will be discussed using adult language, sometimes gratuitously. Get ready to move the conversation forward. This ain't your granddad's news and comment show. This is I Doubt It Podcast with Brittany Page and Jesse Dallimore. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Episode 789 of I Doubt It Podcast. I am your host, Jesse Dollimore, as I frequently am, and as I always am, joined today by the lovely, the talented, and the scholarly, Brittany Page. We are here. We are tired. We are getting up every two hours to take the new puppy outside. She's currently running an obstacle course in your arms, trying to escape. Either that or she's trying to entangle herself (laughs) in my headphone cables because she's doing a pretty good goddamn job of it. Hence the obstacle course. (laughs) People are uh, uh, not believing the fact that we're taking her out every two hours. Yeah, no, that's definitely happening because she is a very tiny animal with a tiny bladder and hasn't built up the bladder control yet. A few accidents here and there, but I feel like she's doing pretty good. She's an outsized um, amount of poop, though. It's seriously, it's just a cavalcade of dog poop. She doesn't want to stop eating. (laughs) So we have a great guest on the show today. Like we promised the audience, we are going to be doing interviews more frequently. So we have another one here with Rory O'Connor, the author of When It Is Darkest, Why People Die by Suicide and What We Can Do to Prevent It. He's a professor at the University of Glasgow and the director of the Suicidal Behavior Research Laboratory there. He is an international expert in suicide prevention, and I came across his book, read it, Thought it was very important, especially with the emails and voicemails that we get from listeners who have been uh, touched by suicide. They're, they have lost family members. They have encountered this in their families. Even in uh, contemplated them, themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is definitely an important topic, and we are so happy that he could join us for this conversation today. We, um, we're going to get to it, but before we do, I want to say that we would invite uh, any follow-up questions, and, and uh, we encourage a, a continued further discussion on the topic. As always, our goal here is to move the conversation forward as best we can as a community. Uh, we love you guys, and we appreciate you, so I'll drop the phone number. 657-464-7609 is our voicemail number. You can also email a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. So without further ado, let's get to the interview with Dr. Rory O'Connor. So Rory O'Connor, thank you so much for joining us. We we appreciate your time and uh, we're we're excited to talk about your book. Um, How are you today? I'm not too bad, Jesse. I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation with yourself and Brittany. And it's sunny and sort of spring-like in Glasgow, Scotland. So all's good, and it's a, and it's the weekend here. So that's that's always a good time. Fantastic. We actually had a a tornado warning we did. come across our phones <laughs> last night for Washington D.C., which is very weird. Let's just say, yeah, <laughs> not no, normal. No, no, a, no. Well, thankfully, we tornadoes don't get as far. West as Scotland, I don't think so. But we had four seasons in the one day yesterday. We had the most amazing sunshine and then awful wind and hail and sleet and snow oh. all within 24 hours. So wow, it was it was, it was, it was an event. Well, it keeps you guessing. That's 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 what's important. <laughs> yeah, on your toes. <laughs> <It does. laughs> so so let me ask Absolutely. you. Um, it is it is obviously important work that you're doing. It is um, a serious topic. Could you could you give us a little bit of a background on on who you are, and then um, what led you to this research? What how did you find your way here? So that's a great question to to start, Jesse. Um, and as I have to go back some time, so my sort of journey in suicide research goes back more than 25 years now. So I'm a 
a psychologist. I'm a professor of health psychology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and I also lead the Suicidal Behaviour Research Lab here in Glasgow. And, and I do lots of different roles in terms of suicide research and prevention. So I'm also the current president of the International Association for Suicide Prevention. And so in a, in a way, that the, being president of, of YASP, as we describe it, I suppose the culmination of that 25 years of work that I have done. And, and so my journey begins actually in Ireland. Um, so I was a psychology undergraduate student at Queen's University in Belfast. And, and I be, was thinking about doing a PhD. I'd done my undergraduate psychology. I really have always been really fascinated by mental health. I remember as a child, been really fascinated or trying to understand mental health and mental well-being and, and really been struck by the stigma often around people who experience mental health problems. So then during my degree, my undergraduate degree, I did some work on depression and I was keen to move that work into a PhD. But then as things sometimes happened or happened serendipitously, um, in the summer of that, of that, my year I graduated from my undergraduate degree, I got a call from the person who turned out to be my PhD supervisor, a man called Noel, and Noel said to me, there's this opportunity to do a PhD on suicide. And although I'd initially planned to continue the work into depression, with this opportunity, I just grabbed it with both hands. And, and that really was the beginning of my journey into suicide research, that just serendipitous phone call. And at that stage, I had no direct experience of losing somebody close to me to suicide. And, but sadly, many years later, Noel, the person who brought me into the field of suicide, and who I mentioned at the start of the book, um, he took his own life. And also a really close friend of mine, Claire, who I talk about quite a bit throughout the book, mm -hmm. she took her own life as well in 2008. So although my sort of interest in suicide research and suicide prevention initially came on the back of trying to understand mental health problems and seeing suicide as the most devastating the most devastating outcome of, of mental health or social distress and social unbearable pain. Um, it became really personal for me or has become really personal for me as I try to understand and still grapple with those two bereavements in my life and then also knowing many other people, sadly, who've lost their struggle to live. I think that that's one of the things I really liked about the book was that you incorporate your own personal experiences with losing people in your life and it's not something you often see in academia, right? There's kind of a encouragement to remain professional and especially in like a therapist setting where you're a blank slate, you don't often talk about your, your personal experiences. So I, I appreciated that aspect of the book. How do you think your personal experiences with losing people that were close to you impacted your approach to your research? I mean, so uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, I find that in some ways difficult to answer. I will try and answer it, but I think it's a difficult question to answer on some level because um, I've always, well, I like to think I've always been pretty compassionate and, and I've always been really passionate about this area. Mm -hmm. And although I hadn't been directly affected in the early days of the work on this and working in this field, I mean, I had so, I thought I had some sense of, of the pain that people who who are bereaved experienced. But I suppose a bit that I, when I reflect on bringing the personal element in, I think, I think the when in particular when I lost Claire to suicide in two thousand and eight because she was such a close friend, and um, a year previously she had just got married, and uh, my wife and I were the two witnesses at their Claire and her husband's wedding, and mm. uh, and so we're so we're really 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 close, and I'd known her since my PhD days in Belfast, and. So I, I, I think it changed me as a person in terms of, although I find it difficult to sort of articulate, I think I'm hoping it's made me a more compassionate person, even though I would like to think I was, a, I was compassionate previously. Mm -hmm. But it certainly gives me, I think, some insight into the pain that obviously um, people experience following bereavement. But also what I tried to do in the book was try to convey some of the sense of the guilt that you feel and the people who, if you lose loved ones to suicide and, the never-ending questions you have. And, and, and really, that, I suppose what I try to do the book then is try to do both two things. Obviously, bring all the, hopefully, the knowledge I have accrued 
where we're doing lots of different research studies over 25 years, but try to bring bring them um, to life in a way with by, by talking about people's stories, and including my own. And, and for me, that sense of being authentic was really important because when I sort of had this idea for the book, I still want to talk about this in the introduction to the book. I couldn't quite settle on the way forward, how I would write the book. I, did, I didn't want to just write another academic book on suicide because there's lots of great ones out there. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to reach this audience beyond those who traditionally read academic papers. And then, so what I was trying to do when, when I was bringing together the person and the professional was tell something of people's stories. And, and I came to this realization that if I was going to tell other people's stories, although in an anonymous, obviously in a confidential way, that the most authentic thing for me to do was mm. to tell my own story. And and I think that's what I, and I, that was a bit which I think, I think has resonated with people, hopefully, and but also was the scariest bit of doing the book because I can write about suicide research and prevention, no end. Obviously, I've done that all my career, but this is my first attempt to really try to bring together both that, those personal reflections and how things have changed for me and, and I suppose just so I'm just thinking back to what you'd asked me specifically, Brittany. I think how it's changed my work is it's given me a renewed sense of urgency mm. um, to to do whatever I can and uh, to contribute in some small way to saving people's lives. And, and part of that urgency I talk about at the start of the book is my father died young, and and I've always had this urgency ever since he died to to do as much as possible with my life in case this big fear I have of, is that I'll die at 51 at the same age as my father, and I'm now 48. And and so ever since I was the age of 24, 23, sorry, when my father died at 51, I, that, that's just, I just had this urgency. And and, um, and so so, that, so it's all those sort of mort- issues around mortality or combined or complicated um, with mortality in the context of suicide. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's really how it's changed sense of urgency but also it highlights to me that those two in particular those two deaths that i've experienced directly is it how difficult it is to prevent suicide on an individual level and if it can happen to so-called experts it can happen to anyone it is it seems to me to be a suicide to, to be unique in that way where it leaves in its wake just such devastation that leaving leaving survivors uh with guilt um questions confusion and I, I think the the manner with which you wrote the book is is great to to answer those personal the personal side of it but do you see because of the si- science of it as well the research and the statistics and the 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 the, the, the data is there a um, do you see policy prescriptions coming out um, that could be tackled by municipalities or governments at large to to tackle the problem as well. Oh, absolutely! I think um, uh, one of the things I've been really, really keen on, and all my throughout my career is, it's no good just conducting research, especially in research and, and, and to the most devastating outcome like suicide, if we can't translate that research into saving people's lives. Right. And there's different ways in which you can do that. And part of that you just mentioned there, Jesse, is a sort of the policy level at the at the local, regional, mun- municipality level, at national level. So what I think there's different ways in which the research, for example, that I do and others have, have done, which contributes to that. Part of it is at a very high level. So one of the things I'm hoping the book does is challenge stigma, challenge the stigma around suicide, dispel myths around suicide, because we know that at a policy level, there's so much more we need to do to basically ensure, to break down barriers to people getting the help and support that they need. And some of those barriers are to do with personal stigma. You you feel stigmatized because you're feeling suicidal or, you, or if you're bereaved by suicide, you don't reach out for help because you feel ashamed of the fact that you've been bereaved by suicide. And I think governments and policymakers have this really, really important I think, I mean, it's an ethical question and it's a responsibility to do as much as possible to challenge that, any stigma and to break down those barriers to help seeking and care and support. doesn't matter who you are. We all have a human 
right to be able to access help and support when we need it, is my view. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what the research that I've been trying to do is try to do some of that mm-hmm. with the book, but also trying to help people understand that. So in the book, so a lot of the books framed around this model of suicide, I developed the integrated motivational volitional model or the IMV model for short. What that's trying to do is provide a framework to help any one of us understand why someone becomes suicidal in the first place, and then to understand this sense of mental pain, which is characterized by being trapped or the sense of entrapment. And and again, we think about interventions. So there's different ways in which you can intervene. We can think at a government level. Are we, are government policies contributing to a sense which people feel more shamed, more defeated, more humiliated, and which they feel trapped by. And if you think about minorities, and it doesn't matter which country in the world we live in, uh, in the United States, ask ourselves the question, what are governments doing to promote equality, human dignity? Right. If we do things which challenge, minor- or are basically discriminate against minorities, for example, I'm just using that as one example, that's increasing risk of mental health problems and increasing risk of suicide. Yeah. And that's one of the messages I try to get across in the book. We are definitely champions of social justice on this show. It is not a, uh, in the United States, too, too, too often it's used as a, a cudgel or a, uh, a pejorative, and we don't look at it that way. So it's, it's great that you, you're taking that, that approach for sure. Well, and where 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 are we right now? Because we're coming out of this pandemic. We're seeing a lot of headlines about increasing rates of suicide. I'm wondering if you can kind of paint a picture for the audience in terms of where we are with rates of suicide in the United States and globally. Yeah, and that's such an important question, Brittany, because so before the pandemic hits and people like me were writing papers and we were all um, concerned that the pandemic was bringing together this perfect storm of factors of economic upheaval and social isolation and people living at home perhaps in situations of domestic violence and abuse and children's schooling being disrupted. And they're all potential risk factors for suicide. Now, the good news has been, and it is really encouraging so far, is that most of the data from across the world, including the United States, um, from high-income countries in particular, because there's a slightly different picture maybe emerging from low- and middle-income countries, um, is that the data from high-income countries, including the U.S., showed that the suicide rates remain stable or even decrease. So there's some evidence of a decrease in suicide rates in, in the U.S. Um, recently. But the important message is not to be um, complacent because, remember, we all, when we try and understand why the, the, the expected increase in suicide hasn't happened in high-income countries, largely speaking, mm-hmm. it's big, partly because there were economic safety nets put in place. Mm-hmm. There was this sense of social cohesion and togetherness and connectedness and a renewed sense of community. Now, my big fear is moving forward is, as we know across the sort of Western world are really grappling with this cost of living crisis and huge um, inflation and, and really there'll be huge challenges on, on, on economically as well as socially, we could start to see a rise in suicides again. Mm-hmm. And the other concern is looking at other countries, for example, looking at Japan, there's some evidence that suicide rates have increased there. There's some evidence that in some of the low and middle income countries, the suicide rates have increased there. So we need to be really, really cautious that overall the picture has been reassuring, but we need to make sure we don't take our eye off the ball. And actually in the US, I think there has been over the last 10 years or so when you're, you're, where your suicide rates have been increasing, there has been huge focus in Congress around suicide and suicide prevention. So I hope that will continue. Now there's one other bit of the story on sort of the impact of the pandemic I would like to just comment on. And that is, so although there is evidence that the suicide rates haven't increased largely in countries like America and the United Kingdom, there is evidence that mental health problems in general have increased, mm. in particular in some groups. So there's lots of evidence from across the world now that at the height of lockdowns in countries where there's lockdowns, that the, the mental health in terms of depression, anxiety, suicidal thinking, um, all increased during the pandemic, especially amongst young people, especially amongst women, especially amongst people with pre-existing mental health problems, as well as those from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds. So although the picture with regard to suicide is reassuring, 
there ha- there's lots of mental distress out there that we need to really, really be careful and ensure that the people who've experienced the brunt of the pandemic, because the pandemic, we talk about all of us being in the pandemic together. That's just not true because we're all experiencing the pandemic differently, especially if we're young pe- if we're a young person, a woman, uh, somebody who's lost their job, someone who is from a socially disadvantaged background or sure. somebody in particular who had previous mental health problems. So we need to really watch out. So on the talking about, I mean, looking backward, it seems that it's, it's difficult to even look backward and have an understanding of why there was a dip in rates of suicide. Um, is, can the same be same? I mean, obvious, I'm, and I know the answer that obviously it's, it's just as difficult to look into the future and predict suicide. Um, why, why is it so difficult to, to, to predict? Well, I think that so one of the reasons it's difficult to predict is it. So as scientists, for example, one of the reasons why we thought the suicide rates would go up immediately or not immediately, but in the, in the immediate, the medium term, because we did think that it would take a while to have an impact is because governments then respond with policies and, and safety nets in different countries. And in the last recession in 2007 and 2008, the global recession, there was um, in countries where there was lots of safety nets put in place, you saw less of an increase in suicide. Now, also, if we reflect on the previous recession, again, in 2007 and 2008, you didn't see the, the immediate impact of the recession for several years. And so it's far too early to really give a definitive answer in terms of what we will see as the impact. Now, the other bit which makes it challenging to predict is that suicide is not caused by a single factor. It's multifactorial in terms of understanding risk. And so now the difficulty is as we move month by month away from the start of the pandemic and we have new challenges in the world. So in the, in the world now we're dealing with the Ukraine crisis. We're dealing with the cost of living crisis. These are things which I know in, in my country, there's young, young people are now talking and being really frightened about what's going on, understandably with the unbearable and unjust and disgraceful war in Ukraine. That, and so our young people, are, that's affecting them, as well as the cost of living crisis. And I mean, there's huge, I mean we're, we're recording this in, at the start of April in the UK, and we've just, today is a day, our, all of our gas and electricity prices and our cost of us he- heating our homes increases by a minimum of 70%. So the, the worst off are going to be most affected, of course. But so that's going to be in the mix now when we try and understand or untangle. That's another risk factor for suicide. So that's what makes it so difficult because it is so multifactorial and because it impacts on different groups of people with different vulnerabilities in different ways. Well, and I think that's what is so beneficial about this book. And I, I'm a mental health clinician, and I, I would say that reading this book has been one of the most beneficial things in terms of all of the trainings that I've received over the years on suicide. This book has been the most beneficial for me personally. And a lot of that is because of your your anecdotes that you share from people you've encountered in doing the research, also your personal story, but also the fact that you focus on this aspect, which is public policy and the ways in which policy influence people's lives and how that can negatively affect them, their mental health, and increase the rates of suicide. I don't think that people often make that connection when thinking about political activism, for example, and how important it is to remain engaged, remain politically active, and take that activist role. Well, absolutely. I think it's, and so thanks for those kind words, Brittany. I really, I really appreciate those. Yeah. So what I I try to do is illustrate that the, when we think about understanding suicide, there's so many different levels we need to think about. Of course, we think on the individual level because ultimately somebody sadly makes a decision, 700,000 people die by suicide each year globally. And, and that's obviously an individual decision, but we as individuals are affected by, of course, our families and our communities, but also impact of policy. And, and, to, and that impact of policy can affect all aspects of our lives. And I think what, for me, what's so important at a government level, and we do this in Scotland, is 
we're, we're currently devising our next suicide prevention strategy, hopefully for the next 10 years. And I'm working closely with government and other colleagues on that. And one of the questions we're getting, we're trying to ask is everything we think about doing, even at a clinical, you're saying as a, as a mental health therapist level, we're asking ourselves, if, you, if you're somebody who's suicidal and you, uh, you go and see a mental health therapist or you go and see somebody in the emergency room following a suicide attempt or you see somebody in social work, what's your experience of that? Does your experience lead you as an individual in distress to feel more supported or more trapped? Mm. More supported or more humiliated? More supported or more shamed? And we're asking ourselves that question are those questions repeatedly it's because what we're trying to get people to think about at a government level and at all levels is that po- these policy things these policies have a trickle down and in- a trickle down impact and on people's individual psyche and how they feel about themselves and remember people who die by suicide have such usually are feeling so worthless and feel that the world would be a better off place without them mm-hmm. and that's because for many of them sadly most of their experiences at community level, at government level, at experience with clinical services or physical health services, or their their local physician, doesn't feel them with a sense that they're worth it or that the world needs them. And we all can contribute something in the world. And what we're trying to do, all of us, doesn't matter what role we play in suicide prevention, we're trying to do one bit. If we, if we can do one thing, which is help somebody else feel more connected with the world, help somebody else feel that they are worthwhile, that is life-saving potentially. And that's why I think all of us, if you're a senator, somebody in Congress, a local councillor, doesn't matter who you are, a chaplain, a pastor, a a parent, a friend, a colleague, we all can do our bits. doesn't matter how small, and all those small bits come together to contribute to saving countless lives. I'm noticing um, some language a difference in language that I'm traditionally used to hearing surrounding suicide. You've you've used the phrase bereaved by suicide several times. You keep referring to died by suicide, where the the common nomenclature surrounding suicide would be had co- someone committed suicide. Um, can you speak to that language change? Yeah, great, great, great question, Je- Jesse, and such an important question because or uh, and comment because. The language around suicide is so important because there's lots of evidence and research evidence as well as anecdotal evidence that the way we talk about suicide can contribute to the distress, especially that people who are bereaved by suicide experience. So the one on committing suicide, the reason we, we try not to use committing suicide is because it harks back to a time when suicide was illegal. It was a criminal act. And, and, I, and I talk about this in the book, is that I've encountered countless people over the years who just hearing that, that phrase, committing suicide, makes them go cold. People who've lost a loved one. And there's something, they, they just, some people often find it difficult to describe why it feels so awful, but it does. And so my, my advice in, in the book, the only, peer, the only part of the book that committing suicide appears is when I'm talking about my decision and, the recommendation from lots of organizations that we do not use committing suicide because suicide is, it should not be a criminal act in our country and and in your country, suicide thankfully isn't a criminal act, but in too many countries across the world, it still is a a legal offense. And so that legal offense, that legal criminality leads to this adds to stigma and it makes it so much more difficult for people to survive if they've lost a loved one to suicide. So the bereaved by suicide is just, I mean, in the United States, people often talk about survivors of suicide or suicide survivors, and that includes people who both died by suicide as well as people who are bereaved. And the reason I suppose I use bereaved by suicide is simply so that's clear that I'm talking about people who've lost a loved one sure. um, to the devastation of suicide. It's the same as how we would talk about I, 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 someone who, was died by, from cancer or bereaved by something. Maybe you may say it slightly differently. Sure. But I just think it's important to make that distinction. What do you think the the the, the origins of 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 the commit the, the, making it illegal is that you think that's born out of 
like religion destroying something God made or, or, or are there, are there reasons in the history behind it that you know of? Well, there, you know, I think the, his, the historical, it's really interesting historically because if you go back centuries, um, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't seen as a illegal act. And but it, so it's been seen as a criminal or a legal act. Like if you go, I can't remember precisely the years now, but like in the 15 and 1600s, and then, but but then it became, but it was more religious. Act. It was like the only person who has the right yeah. to and to take your life is is, is your God or, or God a God figure. So it came from that idea, and and then I think that got weaved in when you have obviously this combination of religious uh, religious and legal arguments coming together. So, but it's but it has it, it's fluctuated throughout history. As I say, there was periods. I think David Hume, the philosopher, I think it was he thought it was an illegal act, and then I, I thought something you should never do. But it's, the views have changed, and different philosophers or key thinkers of the time have had different views. But to my mind, I, I just see it as all of it, it. It is just so damaging to view suicide as as a criminal act. It, it helps no one. It, it's just a devastating thing, and so I'm pleased that more and more countries are removing it from being seen as a criminal act, but we have so much work to do. And, and, and one of the roles and my role as president of the international association for suicide prevention, we try and advocate in different countries across the world to, to make it make, to remove that illegal illegality. So the people will change laws and that, and that's when we work on day in and day out. Seems like it's certainly the first step at removing stigma. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, in the book, Rory, you challenge a lot of myths surrounding suicide. And one of them, I think, is fairly common, even within therapist circles. And that is the idea that self-harm or suicide attempts are attention-seeking or manipulative. Um, Oftentimes, these labels can be attached to people who have personality disorders, for example, uh, can you can you share with the audience why these labels are nonsensical, even aside from being offensive? Yeah, I mean, I um, I always start with a very basic um, response to that when people ask me that question, and it is: ask yourself how you would have to feel to inflict harm on yourself. And and to me, if you, the answer to that question must be that you feel desperate or you can see no other way of achieving what you're trying or to communicate or achieve or cope or respond or stay alive. Mm-hmm. And to me, if you, and that's the most, that's the most compassionate and human response we should all be thinking about. We, need, we should be trying to understand why is it that somebody goes to that extreme response? And so the, the, the attention seeking one, the reason I'm so against that is, I don't dispute that the fact if you if you that somebody who harms himself doesn't matter what their motive their motive was suicidal or not suicidal in intent someone harms themselves and so yeah they're trying to draw attention to their pain so I don't dispute that they're tr- trying to draw attention to their pain and um, or they're trying to draw to attention to the fact that they just can't cope with the unbearable unbearableness of life. Mm-hmm. But well, that's different from saying somebody is attention seeking because when we use the world, the word attention seeking or those hyphenated words, attention seeking, we usually start them with or preface it with it's only attention seeking. Yeah. And so that's the reason I'm against because it's this pejorative term is we're trying to minimize it. And as, as you've said already, Brittany, that's most commonly seen with women who have borderline personality disorder who are, who are harming themselves. And that, and that's awful, awful, because to my mind, it, again, it's not, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the, the clinician or the person who's seeing it or the person who's in distress. So for me, it's trying to think about being more pragmatic about it. Now, in terms of manipulative, the idea of manipulation, everything we do in life is manipulative. You, 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 we both, or the three of us, will have tried to manipulate somebody else today, right? We do it all the time. Everything we do is about trying to achieve a particular end or a goal, or but and and that's for people who often who are, um, have really difficult starts in life, who maybe have experienced trauma early in life, have learned that people who they thought should care for them or trust or care for them haven't, or they've been experienced abuse as children. And they've learned that 
it's difficult to trust adults or trust others. And you haven't learned or haven't been able to learn a way in which they can achieve their relationship goals or, or navigate their emotions or relationships more generally because they haven't had a, a role model or they have they've challenges in doing that. And that's why some people have had to resort to these awful, awfully difficult responses or really challenging responses like self-harming. So we have to ask ourselves, well, why is it somebody's doing that? It's not because they want to do it. It's because they can see no other way in which they sure. can either respond and get um, their needs met or feel some sense of relief. Because remember, for many people who self-harm, it's not about wanting to die, of course. It's about it's the opposite. It's a way of staying alive, mm-hmm. staying alive and coping with the unbearable ex- stress or distress that they're experiencing. So I... I guess I need to up my game because I thought I was doing a really good job of manipulating you this entire <laughs> interview, but, but I guess not. So, um, you know, on the, to, extending this out, kind of maybe the the other side of the coin uh, is the, the the old refrain that I'm even guilty of. I have a, a story that I'll, I'll briefly tell, but is that suicide is is selfish or cowardly and. Mm. Um, I think that's it's something that took me a long time coming out of religious tradition to to get away from. When when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, the chief of naval operations, his name was Matthew Borda. Uh, there was some controversy surrounding what medals he wore on his chest and whether he had actually earned them, and he ended up dying by suicide. Mm-hmm. And I remember being a young Marine and just just being vitriolic about the fact that he that he he died that way. And was really kind of a prick about it, mm-hmm. and it's it's a regret. So, so, but, but, but Jesse, why why were you vitriolic? Um, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really analyzed. I, the, the memory just came to me while we were while we we're talking to you about it. Um, but I was certainly like I remember my leaders, my those uh, Marines I was subordinate to. They were like, "Hey, why don't you fucking calm it down? You're being a radical about it." Do you think it is the influence of the religious yeah, upbringing? Yeah, absolutely. Because I was you... still, I was still an evangelical conservative nutter butter, mm. and um, it's it's also toxic and shitty to be putting um, pejorative labels on it. Yeah. So, no, and you're, you're you're expressing the view of millions of people, Jesse. I think who who those similar thoughts or had those similar thoughts to me again it's a pragmatic thing which is from all the research that we have done on and count as others have done we know that people are so if you accept this idea that most people who die by suicide are trapped by mental pain they're overwhelmed by mental pain they think they're worthless they think they're a burden on others and actually they're this tunnel vision this cognitive constriction they can't see an alternative and they, they think that the only way they can end their pain is through suicide. And remember, they counterintuitively don't think they're, in that, in that moment of acute crisis, often don't think they're, that they're going to harm others because they're, they're trying to end their own pain. And they feel that actually they would be doing their, their loved ones a favor. So rather than being a selfish act, they think it's an altruistic act because the people around them who they think that they're um, a burden on, on will no longer have to bear the burden if, if they're gone. And that's, to me, the most pragmatic explanation for dismissing this idea of seeing suicide as a selfish act. And, and, and also think about when you're so overwhelmed, it's difficult to see alternatives. And we've done a lot of work on future thinking, the way people, think, people who are suicidal think about the future. And their thoughts about the future seem to be really uh, um, unusual in the sense that they can't think of positive outcomes when they look to the future. So that sense of what what have you got to hold on for is limited. They just can't generate those thoughts, those positive thoughts, those reasons for living. Mm-hmm. And so again, I, if you think of somebody's not every every day, maybe it could be they feel that they're worthless. Every day they can't see anything anything positive. They think they're a burden on others. And so suicide, in that sense, is not a selfish act. And again, it serves no purpose. It just adds to the stigma around suicide. Mm-hmm. It's similar. What what you were talking about there reminds me of research on poverty and how the the higher cognitive load when you are in poverty creates a situation where you can't find those alternatives to get yourself out of that situation when you're in poverty too. So I think people 
aren't as aware of the the effects of having all of those stressors and pressure on people and how it affects their decision making process. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And so, uh, even if you add to that community sort of index of of, of stress, we can we've also done work on on, on measuring cortisol, the individual um, stress response on, on people who are suicidal. And so, just to add to add weight to your point there, Brittany. So we know that people who are suicidal release um, over time their stress response system becomes dysregulated and it doesn't it becomes blunted and it doesn't and they don't release as much cortisol as they need to when when they encounter stressful situations because the system just becomes broken. But we think that cortisol is is implicated in good decision making. And emotion regulation, and uh, problem solving. So when you when you think about this perfect storm of factors, then at a physiological level, people in your, in your the example you gave there, are people in poverty, their body's been more stressed than people who are not in poverty. Mm-hmm. And then those who people who repeated who experience um, repeated stressors, or in particular if they experience trauma early in life, which we know can interrupt the stress system, this comes together in this physiological situation as well as in these, you feel trapped psychologically and often you're trapped socially. If, say your relationship's broken down or you're, you've lost your job and you don't see a future in which you will get a relationship again or you'll get that dream job again. All these things come together in this perfect storm, which makes it, you're caught in this, this spiral of despair and that being trapped by despair, then suicide sadly becomes more common, more likely to be an option, more likely for a way for you to end your pain. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems that, I mean, kind of the, the, the obvious would be that we, we should all be working to prevent um, any number of suicides that we can. What are some, what are some focus points on that? Like what are some, what are some things that we could be doing? What are some things that governments could be doing to be aiding in the prevention of suicide? Well, on the first one, on what we can be doing, I would just try and, Try, try and think, remind ourselves to be, compa- be, be compassionate towards others. And I, and I know that sounds trite and stuff, but it's so important. And I talk about in the book numerous people I've met over the years who so, and somebody unexpectedly showed compassion or showed interest in them. And I talk about one, uh, a friend of mine actually, and he, uh, many years ago, and he was suicidal and he left his apartment and I decided in his head, I'm not going to come back. I'm going to end my life. And he was walking, he left his apartment, walking through, through the local park, which he used to take to go to his office. And he, just, and, and he was obviously in a world of his own, just contemplating his own mortality and end of his life. And it just so happened that somebody who took the same route to work to him, a, a, a lady, she, she, start, she smiled at him, and then she could see there was something not quite right. And she just said to him, oh, no, as, he pa- as her paths crossed, are you okay? And, 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 and that was it, right? So that interrupted his suicidal thoughts. And then he talks about then, then what he did immediately, he was like, my God, somebody does seem to give a, t- give a shit about me. Mm-hmm. And, and, that's, and that helped him do two things. One was interrupt his thoughts in that moment when he was thinking the worst. But then it encouraged him to then seek help. And he went straight home then and phoned his GP and got some help. Uh, and the reason for bringing that up is just that those sm- small things, small acts can go a long way. Now, of course, suicide prevention is much more complicated than that. But that would be one in the terms of small acts. Well, we try and every day try and think about something compassionate we can do for others. And that can just be reaching out a call, a text, an email, a WhatsApp, whatever it is to a friend or somebody or a colleague, you just, just to check in with them. Are you doing okay? And then I suppose another bit would be thinking about um, the government level. The government level is one of the challenges we have is, is people don't get access to the help and support when they need it. So I know you, the, your healthcare system is different than the US and it is in the UK, but I think we need to, re, we need to think about ensuring that when somebody is in a suicidal crisis, that they that not only that they get the help that they need when they need it, as in now. So if you go to your emergency room, so obviously you can get treatment immediately, hopefully in an emergency room. 
But then there's often a gap when somebody's discharged. So say somebody is suicidal or it's attempted suicide, goes to the ER, gets some physical treatment. And then there's often this hiatus between discharge from the emergency room and then any ongoing care. Now, the reason that's concerning is we know quite a number of people will, if you're going to attempt suicide again, you're going to do it within the first seven to 10 days, two weeks following that index suicide attempt. So what we need to be doing, governments, I would encourage governments to think are models of care. So we could, what we describe in the sort of literature as clear continuity of care in these moments of crisis. And I think, so that would be two things. And then a third thing and I would sort of also encourage us all to think about is our own self-care. And uh, because all of us, the three of us are talking about this difficult topic today and Brittany, you're probably talking about difficult issues every day in the context of uh, being a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we, that, that any of us do enough for looking after ourselves and trying to be compassionate towards ourselves, be less critical of ourselves. And that's something I do touch on the book as well, because that's something I've struggled with all my life, trying to, be, to have a bit more space, to be a bit more compassionate for me and recognizing that I'm not perfect. None of us is perfect. And that's okay. It's part of the human condition. What another, another is in the vein of, of attempting to prevent as many suicides as we can, should we not be so afraid to talk about, like, you, like bringing up, hey, are you feeling suicidal? I, I know a lot of people, they have, they have it in their head that I don't even want to mention suicide because it might plant the idea in their head. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a misnomer, right? That's, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. It's a complete myth. And, and again, it's, it's sad that it's, it's, it's a myth which has persisted over many, many decades. This idea, as you rightly point out, Jesse, that this myth is, if I ask somebody whether they're suicidal, it'll plant the idea in their head. Not only is it wrong, there is some evidence that the opposite is true. There's some evidence that if you ask somebody directly whether they're suicidal, they're more likely it's more likely to start a life-saving conversation and to get them the help that they need. So I would encourage everyone, doesn't matter who you are, to, if you are concerned about somebody, please ask them directly. And again, because remember, often people who've never told somebody else that they're suicidal, they're hiding this really, dark, for them, dark thought. And it's actually, many people who are suicidal feel ashamed of being suicidal. And so... If somebody, if you, by you asking that question, it opens the door for somebody then to maybe start this conversation and then feel it actually, there's that sense of relief, that sense of unloading, unburdening. And I think that's so, so important. So please do it. And of course, if you're not a health professional, it's really scary. And one of the things I talk about in the book, there's a whole section in the book about how, how do you ask those difficult questions? But of course, the most the clear thing is if you think somebody is at imminent harm of suicide, phone phone the emergency services immediately if you think somebody's imminent harm of, of suicide. But in general, most people aren't, and it's just trying to open that conversation up. So, so important. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked earlier about how difficult it is to talk about serious things like this, that it can be something that you need to practice self-care, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And this is what you do. You research suicide. It's a very heavy topic, um, very difficult to talk about. And you spend a lot of time talking about it and thinking about it. Um, what is the most rewarding part of this work for you? Because I imagine the, the positive effects of talking about this very difficult subject are what keep you going. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I'm continually humbled when people who, when I give talks or do podcasts or when, I, when the book came out or whatever I do publicity and something I say or something in our research either has helped somebody understand why they may have been suicidal themselves and with that understanding, they think that they can feel safer in the future because they may know how to respond differently the next time a crisis is arising. Mm. That's incredibly humbling. As well as then people who've sadly lost loved ones to suicide and I get countless, I mean, loads of messages on social media, on email and 
of people who have found the work that we do, because it's not just me, it's obviously teamwork. Everything I do is a team, it's all teamwork. Mm -hmm. um, but the work that we do has, has helped them understand why their loved one ended their life. Although I can never tell them why their specific, their specific son or daughter took their own life by them reading the book, for example, or having a sense of the model or reading something that I've written in terms of the research that we do, it's helped them in some way. And that's the most rewarding bit. And that is so incredibly humbling. And it's a huge responsibility as well, because mm -hmm. as far as possible, I try to respond to all of those messages in some capacity. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a bit, and it's just, and then, yeah, just get that. So there's, I'll just share one anecdote, which actually I learned just before the book came out last year, which was I gave a talk many years ago in Belfast where I was doing my PhD and I was just, uh, no, so it was after, I was, after I'd done my PhD, but, um, but quite a few years ago and something I said in the talk resonated with somebody in the audience. And at the end of the talk, I don't remember meeting this lady, but apparently she came down and, and spoke to me after the talk. And that was great. And then fast forward a couple of years and she was in acute suicidal crisis. And so first of all, something that something I said, something to do with a particular wording I used, and I can't remember the details, helped her in that moment of crisis. And then after her crisis had abated a few hours, she emailed me out of the blue. And, and I replied to the email. It means in some way I was lucky. I was lucky and I was in the office and I just happened to reply pretty quickly. And, I, and she, to, she told me in this email how this, what I'd said had helped her. And then because of the way I'd replied and I, and I told her to hold on and things will get better and so on, she, she thinks that's helped her stay alive. And, and how I know about that is because on Irish radio, literally on the month or two after my book came out last year, she was on Irish national radio telling this story. And, I, and then somebody told me about, I've heard the recording. So wow. things like that really highlight how, so these small things that you do just, so for her, it was about me. In her head, the way she described it on the radio was, I was this big professor person who had, who had emailed, had replied to her email. Mm -hmm. And that she'd seen me give this talk and those words helped her. But, there was, but that sense of treating somebody as a human being, that sense of human compa compassion and human connection helped to save her life. Yeah. And I'm not story. saying it's, oh, I, yeah, and it's not about me. It's about, it's about this could be any one of us. Mm -hmm. And that's why... I think that I made that point earlier about small things really can make a difference. Anything we can do to interrupt somebody's suicidal thoughts so they don't go from suicidal thoughts to suicidal acts. That's I mean that's just so yeah. powerful. Well, I mean your your registered humility aside, mm -hmm. uh, we very much appreciate your work, and I'm I'm sure that you're. Uh, you're you're honoring both Claire and Noel in in your work every single day, and um, it's something to be fucking proud of. Absolutely, so yeah. We, we really appreciate you uh, giving us your time today. We do have one final question that we want to ask. We we champion on this show changing one's mind when whether the the facts change or your understanding of those facts change, and so mm -hmm. we want to put to you the question: um, What was the last thing that you changed your mind about? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, tough question. Well, no, thanks for your kind words, Jesse and Brittany, about um, um, honouring Noel and, and Claire. It means a lot. Um, and I, as I also try and buy some time for this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think it probably is, and again, I talk about this in the book, is that when I was a young, so when I was a younger person, I didn't really appreciate the, benefits of therapy or reaching out for help myself. And that's quite ironic given the work that I do. And until probably my, my early forties, so I'm 48, as I think I said earlier. So and I went through a really difficult time in my early forties. And so the thing I changed my mind on was that I thought I could sort me out myself and mm. sort my own mental health out myself. So the thing that changed for me was realizing that actually reaching out 
in my case, to a therapist, to a psycho- psychoanalytic therapist was life changing. But that's the thing that I changed my mind about. And I know I would never tell anybody else, anybody else what they should do with their life. But that really turned my, turned my mental health around. And, and I still see, see the same therapist. And so I think that's what changed is learning that you're not John Donne, the famous philosopher talked about no man is an island onto himself, whatever the quote is. And it's recognizing that you don't have to be an island and, and that it's okay to reach out to somebody else for help. I think that's what I've learned. That's and awesome. I've got family. I reach out to family and friends as well, of course, but there's something different about going to somebody who I didn't know. Um, and that, that has been transformative for me. That's a great, great answer. That is great. Far better than like, I, I used to hate blue cheese and now I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually on that note though, I used, I used to hate, hate aubergine. That's a great one. I think about. <laughs> but I learned if you baked, baked aubergine, uh, so I changed my mind on that as well. So there we go. And, well, it's it's a twofer. It's a twofer. We love we love a bonus oh, well, answer. Hold on, and actually, you don't call them aubergines in in the, in the US. Oh, what you call them? The purple, the purple fruit, or the purple vegetable. Eggplant. Oh, what do you call it? Eggplant. 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 That's what it is. So yeah. I changed my mind on eggplant. Sometimes it can be um, a little slimy. Yeah. Well, listen. Yes. That's, yeah. That was my issue. That was my issue, and then. But once I, this recipe, which did a really, it was really good baked. It was baked really well, and then it was less slimy because mm. I hate that sliminess. It's <laughs> listen. I, I hear people. We'll just do another hour just on 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 food topics now. But uh, <laughs> people who don't like Brussels sprouts, it blows my fucking mind. It's just you haven't. <laughs> You, you and haven't listen, had it cooked correctly. This is a problem, I think, more across the pond where you live, where you guys just boil everything. That you're yeah, just no. <laughs> you're ruining shit. Just roast them, yeah, yeah, put yeah. some <laughs> olive oil on them, a little salt, and you got a banger of a meal. <laughs> well, well, well. Just on that Brussels sprouts point, right? Because that's a, that's really timely for me because um, I'm just back from Los Angeles and I had the best ever. Brussels sprouts in Los Angeles last week. And so, and I would have been with you. I was with you going, Brussels sprouts, I only eat them at Christmas. They're usually stinking and overcooked. <laughs> but these were, these were, I don't even know how they were cooked. They were, they were, they were fried, I think, but they were done in a, I can't remember what, but they were absolutely, and they were absolutely delicious. I love the passion. You're bringing, you're bringing the heat about your love for Brussels sprouts and we're here for it. So, <laughs> So, Rory, thanks for your time so much. Thank you even more for your research and your passion on this topic. And your compassion. And, ab- and absolutely for advocating for compassion. That yeah. is something we, we talk about a lot. We, um, it, it, is, it is far easier to punch down, mm-hmm. and uh, it is so important not to punch down, but to be trying to punch up all the time. And uh, it seems in your work you are doing just that. So, absolutely. Thanks for your time today. We appreciate you. Um, have a great day. Great. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed our conversation, uh, Brittany and Jesse. So thanks so much and have a great, a great day yourselves. Take care. So one thing that really came through for me during that discussion was Rory's passion for this subject and also his compassion. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, he made a few comments that it, it, it's trite to give the advice to be compassionate in your everyday life. But it really is something that I think, especially during the pandemic, there's been these jokes that we've like forgotten how to behave in public. and We've forgotten how to be around people. I know, Jesse, you don't understand that because you'll never forget how to be around people. <laughs> <laughs> but for those who may be struggling, I think that's always just a good place to start is that this has been a long haul for people. A lot of people are struggling meeting people with compassion seems to be the best policy. Well, I think like when he said, well, it's tried advice. I, I, I mean, I don't want to push back in the moment, but I think, well, well, one it's people, I think a lot of people do consider it that mm. because compassion is so easy to do. It's, it's such a, it takes no effort to yeah. be compassionate no and, cost. and it goes, yeah. And it goes so long of a way 
toward impacting someone individually in the moment that you have no idea how it's going to carry on in, in their life into the future and right. how that one moment of compassion will will hang with them, will live with them for, for maybe forever. Right. Well, we even saw that moment at the confirmation hearings for Judge Jackson. Absolutely. When yeah. she talked about walking across the quad on Harvard mm-hmm. and um, some random black lady she didn't know, mm-hmm. she said to her when she was at her lowest moment, mm-hmm. she said, persevere. Yeah. It was, a. I think both of us got emotional I'm listening to her tell right the story. Now, yeah. your <laughs> so uh, compassion, I mean, uh, it. It goes a long way. It doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. And it can prevent people from taking their own lives. Absolutely. So I would definitely recommend when it is darkest, why people die by suicide and what we can do to prevent it. I think it is a good resource for anyone. It is also particularly good for mental health clinicians who are working directly with populations that are struggling with uh, mental health disorders suicidal ideation. It's very important. So uh, definitely recommend when it is darkest, why people die by suicide and what we can do to prevent it. Hopefully you learned something from this conversation. Hopefully it is something that you got something out of, something that you appreciate. And like Jesse said at the top of the show, we would definitely welcome your feedback. 657-464-7609 or I doubt it at dollamore.com. So with that, we are going to leave you. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for the community that is built up around this show. Uh, If you'd like to support our work here, our continued work on the show as we approach 800 episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash I doubt it podcast. Choose your tier, look into what's involved in being a, a, a Patreon supporter. And for as little as $2 a month, you can support and produce what we do here on the show on an episode by episode basis. Anyway, we love you guys. We'd love to hear from you. We will see you next time. Until then, for Brittany Page, I'm Jesse Dollimore, and this has been I Doubt.